G'day everyone, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as we continue a brand new series here on this channel where I am going through each of the 18 clubs, again in reverse alphabetical order, yes this is the third 18 team series that I'm doing, uh, where I talk about what each club's New Year's resolutions, if you like, would be for 2024. So I've picked out, you know, half a dozen to eight or so um, resolutions or goals or outcomes that each of the clubs want to achieve in 2024. So far, I've done the Western Bulldogs, and today we are doing the mighty West Coast Eagles. So I've picked out a few things that uh, you know are somewhat realistic. I'm not going to say that everyone's uh, New Year's resolution is to make finals or win the Premiership or anything like that. I've tried to lower the eyes a little bit and pick out individual things for clubs that they can work on and look to achieve in the coming year. So, like I said, this is the third 18-team series that I'm taking on. This is going to be a playlist called 2024 AFL Resolutions. Uh, then there's also a 2024 analysis video that I've done for each of the 18 clubs, which is a playlist on this channel. And there's also a uh, playlist on this channel for AFL Best 22s in three years that you can find. So I've been doing a lot of team-centric content. I've also done plenty of Eagles content. So if you're just discovering the channel for the first time, there's also a playlist called Eagles Corner, uh, where I just, every time I make an Eagles video, I include it in that. So this video will be part of two playlists. So just so you're aware of all the content that's available to you now, um, and we can get stuck into the West Coast Eagles and their New Year's resolutions. So uh, I've kind of ordered them in random order, uh, but I'm just going to rattle them off. So the first one, I'd say the biggest thing the Eagles need to overcome is the injury situation. So uh, in 2022, we saw us get absolutely decimated by injury and COVID at the same time because, um, you know, it's easy to forget now that uh, the pandemic seems like a long time ago, but uh, in particular, there was a lot of COVID isolations in WA that year. Uh, but for whatever reason, in 2023, the injuries got worse and meant that we went into several games with only a handful of players. I think at one point, we only had one player in the waffle uh, playing in reserves behind the AFL team and the non-playing emergency. So things were absolutely dire. And I think, uh, you know, as much as we don't want to make it sound like we're making excuses, there's no doubt that the injury situation made us look a lot worse than we were at times. It doesn't mean that there weren't inexcusable results anyway, but across the board, generally speaking, uh, it made it hard to stay competitive in some games. Some games we didn't have that excuse, but in others we probably did, specifically the Adelaide game uh, last year at Adelaide Oval, uh, where we had no backline, for instance. It also made it very, very hard to transition new players into the side um, and give them the the protection, I guess, that they needed. You know, Ruben Jinby played a lot more of a central on board uh, role than he probably should have in his first season. Hopefully, that'll hold him in good stead going forward. Uh, but that's just one example. Campbell Chester probably should have played a little bit more waffle than he did. But again, hopefully, there's some upside from him playing AFL level. I think he played about 14 games in the end. Uh, and also, just to transition the game style. At the end of 2021, there was a big um, push towards you know a new, faster game style because we looked slow and stagnant a lot. Uh, so when we saw the team play that game style well in the first three rounds of the season, it looked like there was going to be promise. And obviously, everything fell away. So all we're asking for is just a more reasonable run with injury, something comparable to the rest of the competition. Because last year, as you can imagine, you know, there's a ladder for injury games lost and the Eagles uh, led two different types of stats. Types of stats. Games lost to injuries, they were top ranked for that. And also, uh, they had 195 games lost to best 22 players, um, which is just ridiculous. So I won't harp, any, harp on anymore. Fixing that will fix a lot of other issues. The second point is probably just minimizing the long periods in games where the Eagles got absolutely dominated. So uh, not only, did, obviously, where there was a lot of games where the scoreline was massively inflated, um, I think there was also a, a real trend of, even when we'd start to play well, when we'd lose momentum, we would go from being competitive to completely pathetic. And I don't want to make this a, a really negative video. It's meant to be somewhat uplifting. Uh, but the idea is to, to, to stop or mitigate those periods where we just cannot get our hands on the ball, cannot win a clearance, where at times this year that would last, you know, five, six, seven, eight goal runs. If we can mitigate that and make it two or three to four, uh, you know, that would be a big improvement. So it's specifically long periods where we can't get our hands on the footy and generate anything meaningful in terms of ball movement, that is an area the Eagles really need to work on. The next one kind of flows onto that, uh, and I would say that having a percentage of 75%, so our percentage this year was about 53%, which is uh, beyond pathetic. So we're scoring 50% or 53% of uh, what our opposition scored this year. Um, and that's, you know, 
If you followed the season, you know, through 2023, you're going to understand exactly how that number got so low. Uh, there was five games where we lost by more than 100 points. There was obviously a 171-point loss to Sydney, which in itself is like two bad losses. Uh, Hawthorne beat us by about 116. Adelaide beat us by 122. So, you, you, like I said, if you fix the first two issues, then this one becomes a lot more achievable. And a, a percentage of 75% would probably be enough to avoid the bottom two, which is my next resolution. The West Coast Eagles should be striving to avoid the bottom two this year. I don't think we necessarily need to push for finals. That's just not where, where we're at. So it would be a nice outcome, obviously. Uh, but avoiding the bottom two would show clear improvement. And I think that's realistic and... I know there's an argument to say we need to high, get high draft picks. From what I know over the 2024 draft, the top bunch of players are fairly even anyway. So I would focus on trying to trying to get as many wins as possible within within reason. Obviously, uh, we can try and get as many wins as possible, but it might only end up we get four or so anyway. So if we can get a percentage of 75% and win four, five, six games, I'd say five or six games is a more realistic and, um, and, and worthwhile goal. I would say if we could do those things, we'll avoid the bottom two. Like I said, a percentage of 53 is unacceptable. But what I would say is the way the Eagles finished the year was fairly uh, promising. So four out of the last five games, we had what we would say were good results. The fifth one in that run of games, the last five, was quite unfortunate. It was one of our worst losses of the year to Fremantle. But we nearly beat Essendon. We challenged Adelaide, who are a good side. We beat the Bulldogs. We beat North Melbourne. So as a, in terms of four out of five games, that if we carry that form into next year, then everything else I've alluded to is quite achievable. The next resolution I have is to continue to expose the young trio of Jinby, Hewitt, and Reed to you know football at the top level. So like I said last year, Jinby played 17 games before getting injured. Hewitt played 14 games around injury, and that's a really good start. And I think we can maybe look towards a, a 2024 where both of those guys play at least 20 games. You know, there might be need to be rested and managed. And I know Hewitt's got a bit of a toe issue at the moment. I'm hoping that doesn't affect his round one availability. But if we can get all three of those players to play 20 games each, I think that is the nucleus around which we will build our next finalist side. Yes, there's other top-end talent there. I mean, Oscar Allen is kind of still part of that as well. But that trio in particular, getting games together, I'm sure this is kind of a no-brainer. This will happen. But I'd say that's a really important thing the Eagles want to achieve out of this year is those guys getting exposure at AFL level. The next resolution I've got is probably just find a functioning balance of tools. And now this is sounds like such a luxury to the West Coast Eagles because we haven't had enough players to think about list balance or best 22 balance in a given game. We just literally just pick the best 22 out of a, an available 26. So this would be a bit of a luxury, but I'd say all things being equal, if we, we've got a degree of fitness in the team, I'd say the the introduction of Matthew Flynn as a ruckman will have an interesting flow-on effect as to what our best 22 will look like, specifically that it makes Bailey Williams probably spend a little bit more time as a forward ruck, which then makes the forward line a little bit taller and does it potentially push out a Ryan Marrick, which I think is really not what I want. I know I, I've named Jinby Hewitt and Reed as guys we need to give games to, but there's obviously a lot more than that, and Marrick is one of them who has some really... Really good AFL traits, I would argue. So I think to find a forward line mix that works where we can give Marek games and also have a functioning one-two punch dynamic with Flynn and Williams both playing, because I don't want Williams to be forced out of this side. I think I want Flynn to come in and succeed. I want Williams to succeed as a forward ruck. And I just want us to have a functioning forward line that isn't too tall uh, and that also isn't necessarily depriving other young players of opportunity. So how they do that is obviously a much harder question to answer. The next resolution will be to unearth an unexpected quality player aside from the obvious. So we've taken some high draft picks, Jim B. Hewitt and Reed, even Ryan Marrick. I suppose, you know, he was number one in the mid-season draft. It is a little bit more speculative, but nonetheless, he did come with a little bit of a profile. But, you know, another example of that would be Noah Long, who we took with pick 58 in the 2022 draft, who we didn't expect to play well and now looks like one of our best young talents. So what is really obvious is that the teams that generally build premiership lists do so by unearthing talent from later in drafts. It's not always about top-end talent and getting high draft picks. Obviously, that model isn't really sustainable. You need to be nailing picks later in the draft as well. And so I'll, I'll list a few nominations for who that player could be, and it would be great to see someone just rise to the top this year that we didn't expect. So the first most obvious one, I think, is Kobe Bergeel in terms of just my personal opinion, what, we, what I've seen of him, what I've heard about him playing in the waffle, provided he gets his hamstring right. 
I think he's the most likely to come in and at pick 29 be somewhat of a unlikely gun. I suppose it's not really unlikely. He's still a second round draft pick. But some other later options would be Harvey Johnston, who I just haven't really formed a strong opinion on yet. Locke Rawlinson, I do think could be a little bit of smoky with the way he plays, could could find his way into the team. Tyrell Dewar as well. Cat B rookie who ended the year really well last year and apparently wasn't that far off the selection frame as well, which is really, really promising from a Cat B rookie. And same thing with uh, Jordan Baker, another player who has the you know, the potential to, to come in and be a role player as a medium-sized defender. I hope if he finds his way into the team, it's not because of severe injury uh, to other players. I, I hope it's because he's earned it. And then someone like a Harry Edwards as well, who has obviously been given games early in his career, showed a degree of promise, battled injuries hard, kind of fallen off um, by the wayside a little bit to some extent. But Harry Edwards kind of leads into my final resolution for the West Coast Eagles, which would be to find a key back successor to McGovern and Tom Barat. So I already mentioned Harry Edwards, and he kind of looms as uh, maybe not a critical player in our future, but gee, it would be really nice if he comes in and finds his potential because he did have that athleticism. I think he had some groin injuries I think his uh, speed has been affected subsequently, so hopefully he can overcome that. But the other one is Rhett Bazo. So I suppose what I'm really saying here is if Rhett Bazo and Harry Edwards, whether it be in the waffle or at AFL level, or even just stints at AFL level, if they can give us some confidence that they could be the guys to take over from Barras and McGovern, because McGovern will be 32 in 2024, uh, which obviously puts him right at the back end of his career, obviously had some injury issues himself. And Tom Barris will be, uh, he will be 29 this year. He's born in 1995. So a 29-year-old Tom Barras, um, obviously we need to find some reinforcements. And whether, well, I probably think we probably need to draft the key back anyway, but it would be a huge win out of this year if one or both of Bazo or Harry Edwards could prove themselves to be worthy of being the next key back in this team. The other one I'll shout out is Callum Jamison. He's obviously a ruckman, uh, but has played a little bit as a key back. I've just sort of thrown him in there as a bit of a wild card. Could he be someone that we unearthed that is unexpectedly good as a key back? I'd say he's behind the other two. And I still think Rhett Bazo will have a future at AFL level, whether it's more as a third tall interceptor at first anyway. And then Harry Edwards is a bit more of that 200 centimeter defender who can you know, line up on the Max Kings, etc. So I think those are all important questions that the Eagles need to answer in 2024. And I think all of those are somewhat realistic. They won't nail all of those, but if we can achieve most of those, then we'll probably have had a uh, pretty successful year. But Eagles fans, let me know in the comments section what you agree with and disagree with for a start and throw a few other resolutions, but try and keep them realistic. Um, obviously, we can. We, there's no limit to what a resolution could be. Like I said, it could be win the premiership, but uh, just throw th- some things you'd like to see from this club in 2024. But for now, I'll leave it with you. Let me know in the comments what you're thinking, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.